The motor on your e-mountain bike is at the heart of the system and it does get a lot of abuse. So now and again, it's worth giving it a bit of a clean and a little mini service. And that's exactly what we're gonna be doing today. Now, one of the first questions you need to ask yourself is whether you need to remove the motor from your bike. Now, a lot of these units are actually guaranteed for many miles and many years of service-free riding. There's no need to service those internal parts. And there's definitely no need to remove the motor from your bike for a basic cleanup and a mini service. There are, however, some reasons you may want to remove the motor from your bike. Maybe if you've got serious mud ingress around the motor, or you've got a fork with the motor and you need to send it off to a third party, or maybe you've got a broken lead in there, or maybe you just need to fit some fresh new cables to like your dropper seat post, something like that. Now, if one of those reasons apply to you, there's lots to think about here. One is gonna be the specialist tools that you require to remove that motor. Two is gonna be the time. It can be quite a lengthy process. And three is the potential damage that you can do to the components on the bike. Lots of snap connectors, left-hand threads, or components that can get damaged really easily without basic knowledge. You also need to look at how your motor is mounted into your bike if you are considering removing it. Now, if you've got a basic hardtail, it's usually a case of doing three or four bolts and the motor will come away fairly easily. However, if you've got a full suspension bike, you may find that some of the motor mounts are actually built into the linkage of the frame, meaning that you're not only removing the motor, you're also going to have to disassemble that whole rear linkage of your bike. Now, doing some of that work may actually invalidate your warranty on some bikes, so you need to check your paperwork first. And I don't want to scare you off because it definitely is very satisfying removing that motor from the bike. However, if you've got any doubt in your skills of removing it, then you need to head to your local bike shop. Get them to do it. They've got knowledge. You're going to be covered by them if anything was to go wrong. And of course, they might have that prior knowledge and the specialist tools required to remove that motor. So how do these motors differ in the way that they're fixed to the bikes? Well, here is my Canyon Spectral with a Shimano E8000 motor fitted to it. And over here is my Specialized Levo with a Brose motor fitted to it. And there are some big differences. The Brose on the Levo has big plastic covers surrounding it versus the E8000 minimalistic plastic shrouds protecting the electrics. The Brose motor has different fixings holding it to the frame and bolted through the swing arm versus the E8000 three bolts straight through to the frame. And looking underneath, the bash guards and the protection of the motors is very different too. Also, the way the battery connects to the motor is very different. The motor here on the Levo has an external connection versus the E8000's internal connection, both two different ways of doing the same job. Now, I must stress that you don't need to remove anything aside from those outer plastic covers to do a basic clean and a service. The type of battery system you have on your e-bike can also help or hinder that motor removal process. As a rule of thumb, if you've got an internally mounted battery, things can get pretty tight around all that cabling and lead, so you really need to take care when removing and replacing that motor. However, if you've got an external battery, you do tend to have a bit more access to those cables and lead to it does become a bit of an easier job. Some bikes such as the Levo SL actually require the motor to be swung out of the way before you can even remove that battery. Now one piece of kit that is gonna make life a lot easier when it comes to removing that motor or working on your e-bike in general is gonna be a work stand. Just makes that bike a lot more accessible. And of course, one thing you want to remove out of the equation is gonna be your battery. One, it's gonna make that bike lighter to lift into the work stand, and two, you're not gonna run a risk of that motor starting up when you're working around that area. Right, so let's get into giving this motor a bit of a clean and a little bit of a mini service. I've got all the tools lined up on the bench I'm gonna need for today's service on that Bros motor, but of course, it's gonna be different tools for every different motor out there. So I'm gonna be using a wide range of Allen keys here. I've got them all the way up to eight mil an adjustable wrench that can go up to 32 mil, got a wide range of lubes and some dielectric grease on there, as well as some muck off corrosion defense spray. Of course, some gloves to protect my hands, stop them getting covered in grime. I've got a 24 mil uh, socket there for the output shaft on the motor. I've got the BBT-8 tool uh, to remove the lock ring off of that motor. And one of the most essential tools to the job is a two-legged puller to remove the spider from the crank. And lastly, a torque wrench to make sure I'm torqued up to all those recommended uh, torque settings and some cleaning brushes too. 
Okay, first things first, you need to drop the battery out, something that we did earlier on, just to make sure that motor isn't gonna turn on. And before you put the bike in the work stand, it's worth checking those crank bolts to see how tight they are. On the Levo, it's a self-extracting bolt, and these can be really tight, something that is pretty much impossible to do when it's in a work stand. So just crack them off before you put that bike in there. So we're just loosening these bolts, we're not actually removing them, we're just getting them nicely loose. As you can see, they're pretty tight. You don't want to be taking these arms off. Right, bike's in the work stand. I'm putting my gloves on. It is time to get a little bit dirty. Well, first up, I'm going to remove my chain off the front chain ring. So I'm going to use that lock tab on my SRAM mech. Just push that in. And that's just going to give me a load of slack chain. Then I'm going to undo the front chain guide and just pivot that out of the way. Then remove that chain off of the chain ring. Right, time to remove this drive side crank arm. I'm literally just gonna spin these bolts off. And it's a self-extracting bolt on the Levo. So as I wind that inner bolt, you should see that crank arm come off. Sometimes the outer bolt can undo too. So if that does happen, you just need to tighten that, but just focus on that inside eight mil. Load a lock tight on there, as you can see. Right, that's the drive side crank remove. Now just note which side goes on the, on the drive side which is gonna be your left-hand uh, crank also. Usually there's gonna be an R and an L marked on the inside of that crank arm if you do get confused, but just lay them out on the workbench. As I get deeper into this system, it's quite interesting to see how much mud and gunk is actually around here, so I'm quite excited to get into this next step. For this, you're gonna need a BBT18 spider lock ring tool. So this undoes the castle, castellated nut, which is the lock ring for the spider. Now the reason we didn't remove that non-drive side crank is because you're gonna need it for this. So you just slot that on, get your big spanner onto that lock ring, and crack it off. It can be quite tight. So just maybe you need to stick it on the floor just to undo that. And then you just undo this standard anti-clockwise motion. Once that's out of the way, all we're gonna do now is just remove that non-drive side crank because we're not gonna be needing that either. Exactly the same process as that drive side one. Just undo that center bolt and you'll see it pull off of the axle. Next thing we're gonna do is remove the spider off of the crankshaft itself. So for this, you're gonna need a special tool either from Brose, which sits on the outside here, or what you can in fact do is use a 24 mil socket, which is gonna do exactly the same job. Because if you put the two-legged puller and push on the end of the output shaft, it can damage those bearings inside. So you definitely need to put a socket which rests up against the outer of the casing rather than pushing on the output shaft. Now it's time to get the two-legged puller into the mix. Now I've ran into a bit of a problem here. I've just realized that the jaws on this two-legged puller are actually too big to fit behind the spider. So maybe even once you've got those tools, it's worth checking that they are compatible with what you're actually using. Now luckily, I've got a smaller version that I've managed to find in my tool cupboard. This one with a lot smaller jaws, which is gonna fit nicely behind that spider. So we're gonna put the 24 mil socket over the output shaft, line the two-legged puller up nicely there, and then we're just gonna wind it in till it contacts that spider. Now some of these can be quite tight, some might come off fairly easily. So just try it with finger pressure first. This one is actually coming off already, I can see it moving. So I'm just gonna apply a bit more tension with the Allen key. It's just gonna pull that spider off nicely off of that shaft. There you go. Right, so that's the spider and all that drive side crank removed. I'm just gonna clean this up a little bit, then we're gonna spin the bike round to the non-drive side, as that's where all the electrical leads and components are. Cleaning this area, you don't wanna be using a degreaser. Something like this ultra corrosion defense spray from Muckoff is gonna be ideal. It's just gonna get that moisture out of there and just provide a bit of a protective layer. And it also stops all these components rusting out too. So really good stuff. As I say, do not use degreaser because that can of course enter the motor and you don't want those bearings having the grease taken out of them. Right, so I've just been using a cloth just to get the worst of that off. I'm just gonna use this little brush just to try and get out most of that gunk from in there. Just spin that motor around, just work your way around, just trying to get rid of the most of that. So I'm pretty happy with that, it's looking pretty good. Ready to apply some grease back on that crank axle and get our lock ring done back up. 
Right, we've span the bike around to the non-drive side, so I'm just gonna remove this cover. Now this is held in place by four three mil Allen bolts, so we're just gonna work our way around on these, just undoing them systematically one by one as we go. So just spin those off. So this is where all the electrics are gonna be hidden by all your leads and your connections. So just go steady with these. If you have got a magnetic holder, I suggest using them for these bolts because if they disappear, they are gonna be a nightmare to try and locate. So these are all the same length, so there's no way of mixing these up. We're just gonna spin them out. Okay, so we're just gonna remove this panel, just give it a bit of a pull. You should see it come down. It's actually located higher up, so just give it a bit of a pull down, and you should see this area, which is now gonna be fully exposed, all the different leads connecting to that motor. Now, before you go removing any leads or getting your fingers into that motor area, I suggest taking a quick photo on your phone of those leads and how they're actually bunched up together into that motor really is invaluable when you go back to putting those leads back in because it can be quite a tight fit in there so just take a quick snap then you've got that for reference right so the first lead i'm going to remove out of the motor is the battery power lead now this is actually held in place with a little locking tab onto that connector so you just use a little flat blade screwdriver locate that locking tab and just lift it and give the motor lead a bit of a pull and that should see it coming out fairly easily. There you go, so that's the motor battery lead. So it's really worth cleaning these connections up on both the lead and the battery connection. These are actually magnetic on the specialized bike so they are quite prone to picking up bits of swarf as well. So just use a brush around there and on the battery just to make sure they are nice and clean. Right, we just got a couple of leads left. You've got this lead from the TCU and your handlebar control unit. So this hasn't got a connector. You just need to go steady. Try and grip the actual connector rather than pulling on these wires. You want to hold it here. Just give that a quick wiggle and inspect that too. And lastly is the speed sensor wire. So this, again, don't go pulling on these wires. You want to grip the actual hard plastic part of it. Give it a wiggle. It should see it coming free nice and easy. Right, so that's those leads all disconnected. Now I'm just gonna shine my torch into each one of those ports just to make sure there's no uh, water damage or any grit or nastiness getting in there. And they look pretty clean to me, so I'm just gonna focus my attention on uh, just the leads themselves. Now I'm just gonna give them a wipe around with a microfiber cloth and just spray a bit of contact cleaner into each one of these just to drive any, you know, if there's any little bits of moisture in there, it's just gonna help that come out. Once again on here, it doesn't harm to put a little bit all over these connectors just to stop that water build up. Uh, if anything does go onto them, it's literally just going to run off. Then on each one of these leads, I'm just going to put a tiny little bit of dielectric grease. That way it's just going to stop that water actually penetrating the system at all and it just gives it a really nice connection. So with this dielectric grease, we're just aiming to go round that rubber ceiling of the uh, the connection and you can put a bit inside too it's not going to do any harm whatsoever so just go on both of those connections just a bit of grease don't go overboard you don't want to absolutely load it up with grease you're just trying to prevent any water ingress going on so just adding that into there and then it's just a simple case of plugging these back in now they will only go in one way so there isn't any chance of confusing these so just connect them and once you are connecting them just make sure they do a loud click just to make sure they are fully home into their connections. Right now it's time to focus on that battery to motor lead connection. Now this is really important. If this connection isn't good, you're not gonna get any power to your motor whatsoever. So I'm just gonna give it a quick wipe around with a microfiber cloth first, just to get the worst of that grime off. Obviously paying attention to both of those connections. Um, so the actual internal one is fairly clean to be fair. I'm just gonna spray that with a bit of contact cleaner. Again, just drives that moisture out and provides that good connection. So that's all nice and clean and got the stuff ready in it. And at the bottom, again, just gonna spray that up. Just pay particular attention to the seal that goes around that connector, that connector actually, because that can actually lead to water ingress. So just make sure it's absolutely spotless, as, as, as good as you can get it. Get all those bits of mud out. And again, as I mentioned earlier, they are magnetic. So just check there aren't 
any tiny little bits of metal particles in there because that won't help that connection either. And once you're happy with that lead, you can just run a little bit of dielectric grease ar around again on both those connectors to make sure it's nice and solid. Now once you're happy that lead is nice and clean, there's no dirt on it whatsoever. It's time to focus on that connection on the battery also, so don't forget about that one. So talking about this, and again I can see there's some grime and some dirt building up onto that, so I'm just going to squirt a bit more of the cleaner in there. Again, this just provides a bit of protection, stops all that rust building up and drives that grime out. Now I'm going to use a little brush as well, just to get in there a little bit better. You can of course use like a little toothbrush for this, but this little brush is really good. Just getting all these little bits of dirt out, Any, anything in there that can hamper that connection is worth getting out. Right, so I'm pretty happy with how that's cleaned up. I'm gonna place it over there. And again, the lead is nice and clean, so pretty pleased with that. Put that to one side. Then it's a case of just cleaning these outer covers up. So just give that a quick spray. Again, this stuff is gonna stop all that water build up. So if any water was to get on this, it provides a surface that can easily run off and not build up. And that comes into the mud and the other gubbins you can get out on your ride, all that trail debris. So I'm just gonna clean this spider up a bit with some degreaser here, just to get all that grime off the back of the spider, something that's not quite accessible when you're doing your normal cleaning. Just let that do its magic first, getting all those nooks and crannies, and just inspect the actual fitting of the spider as well, get all that grime out of those splines as well. There's no need to grease the actual spider up itself because there's an interference fit so adding grease isn't actually going to do any uh, any help whatsoever. So I'm just going to wipe around that, make sure that is nice and clean too, especially where that lock ring goes into. All right, so that's looking a load cleaner. Whilst you've got those cranks off, it's really worth giving them a quick clean too, especially around the back of the crank interface, somewhere you can't really get to unless you take those cranks off. And when it comes to putting the cranks back on, I'm just going to put a bit of grease on the inside of these splines just stops all the uh, creaking going on, stops that moisture coming in as well. So just apply a little bit on the inside here. When you go to put those cranks on, it's gonna be a lot easier. And as I say, stop any creaking from developing too. So nice bit inside of there. Right, and now it's time to put the battery lead back into the bike. So I'm just gonna apply a little bit of dielectric grease around this before I put it back in. It's got a nice little coating around that. Really good stuff, this dielectric grease. Just helps that connection remain nice and secure. And plug that back in there. Again, it will only go in one way, so just make sure that locking tab is going to engage once you push that back into the motor. Again, it should be a nice audible click when you push that back in. Just make sure that is nice and secure. Push that two thumbs, make sure it's there. And just bring it out of the way. Just give you a bit of room to do that last bit of cleaning. Right now we're just gonna clean around these connections. It doesn't hurt to get a bit busy in there, disturb some of that dirt because all of your connections are now closed off with the wires. Of course, just make sure that drain hole on the bottom of the motor is definitely clear of mud. I've got no big mud buildup whatsoever in here actually, so it's quite surprising that it's uh, done a great job here. Also, I'm just gonna wipe around the edge of this motor like I did on the outside of the other plastic cover, just to get the worst of that grime off. Again, we're not using degreaser here. We're just going really careful, especially around that motor axle itself. Right now, time to replace this outer motor cover. You've got a little groove here, which that motor lead fits in. So just locate that. And then you've got the spline. So just line it up, push it upwards, and you should see it all line up nice and smoothly. You should probably just clip into place. Look through the bolt holes, make sure they're all lined up then we're just gonna replace those bolts one by one. Now from the factory, these come with Loctite on them. It doesn't hurt to add just a bit of thread lock or Loctite on there just to make sure they don't rattle loose. And when you're doing these up, they are one newton meters and you're dealing with plastic here. So you don't wanna be using the full length of the Allen key. Literally, we're just nipping these up just firmly, not even tight. Right, so once the casing's on, we're just gonna install that left-hand crank arm, as we saw earlier. Put a little bit of grease on there just to go onto these splines to stop any creaking going on. So just locate that in line with the splines. Apply a little bit of pressure, and you should see it line up. Then just wind this bolt on too. You can, of course, 
add a little bit of Loctite to this bolt if you see fit, but from the factory, it has got quite a lot on, so I'm not gonna add any more to it. Now we're not fully tightening these up. I'm just gonna do it by hand on here. Just give me something to purchase against when I do the lock ring up on the other side. So before we fit that drive side crank, I'm just gonna give the frame a bit of a quick uh, wipe over. There's lots of inaccessible areas often when the chain ring is in the way. So just take advantage of that, you know, all around this lower pivot bolts. Inside of my chain guide's looking pretty grubby, so I'm gonna wipe that all out. Just stuff that you can't necessarily get to that easy. Just take advantage of that before we go to fully fit in that crank. So with the spider, there's no need to fit any grease onto this. It's an interference fit, so you don't need to put anything on there. We're just gonna line it up with the splines on the motor itself, nicely in place. Then we get the lock ring and wind that back in as well. So just line that up. Just start with your fingers at first, just to make sure you're not gonna cross thread it. It is quite tricky to get that started. So when it comes to tensioning that castle nut, you might notice that you can't actually do it up anymore because your motor starts spinning. So for this, you need to replace the chain onto the chain ring, then grab that non-drive side crank to get that last bit of tension to that castle nut. And the castle nut is tensioned up to 50 Newton meters of torque. So get a torque wrench on there, and make sure that's cranked up nice and tight. Right now, just the finishing touches, I'm just gonna do that chain guide back up, line it up nicely to make sure my chain isn't gonna come off. That's nicely tight. And then we're gonna add the crank arms. Obviously, just make sure your cranks are opposite to each other, line them up on the splines. Put some grease on there already, so we're all good to go with that. Line it up, and then crank that up with the eight mil Allen key. You wanna be putting 50 Newton meters of torque through the bolts on the cranks, just to make sure they're held on there nicely. And again, I'll just do that last bit of tension with the bike on the floor, rather than the work stand. Right, so the bike's on the floor, we're just gonna add that last bit of tension to the crank bolts, then get the torque wrench on to make sure they're nicely cranked up to 50 newton meters. Right, so the system's turned on. I'm just gonna engage walk mode. There we go, motor engages nicely. And maybe just give it a quick road test up the road just to make sure it's all good before you do hit the trails. But there, there we go. Motor refresh and clean all done. Pretty simple if you've got the right tools, but as I mentioned earlier, if you are a bit, little bit worried about it, take it down to your local bike shop to get it sorted. But let us know down in the comments if you service your own motor or if you're confident about doing this sort of work. Love to hear from you guys. Give us thumbs up if you enjoyed it. Make sure you subscribe to us here on EMBN and give us a find and a follow on social media. Cheers for watching and get tinkering.